Today on CityCast Chicago, St. Louis groups want to help house asylum seekers. Cook County Jail has its lowest population in 40 years, and the future of streetball in Chicago isn't looking great. Helping me break it all down is freelance journalist Crystal Paul and Northwestern professor and author Ariane Nettles. It's Friday, October 20th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is What Chicago's Talking About. Morning, Ari. Morning, Crystal. How y'all feeling today? Good. Good. How you doing? I'm doing good. It's been a solid week thus far, even though when I look outside this window, you know, don't make me too excited to go outside. Before we get into looking back on the news from this week, this week in Chicago, you've got Music Box of Horrors at the Music Box Theater. You've got movies in the park showing horror films. you got the Horror Film Festival uh, tomorrow and Sunday. So I got to start with this question. Uh, one do you like scary movies? And if you do, what's a favorite one of yours? And if you don't, what's the movie that messed you up? <laughs> Krista, you lit up when I asked this question. And so I got to start with you. I'm going to ask, even though it feels obvious, do you like scary movies, Crystal? I love scary movies. I love <laughs> scary movies. Mostly because they're actually kind of hilarious. Honestly, I don't like being like really scared. But most of the time when you find yourself scared, like in a haunted house or something like that, you're laughing, right? Because you're like, that was hilarious that something scared me, even though I know it's not real, right? <laughs> I went to a horror, I went to a haunted house last week, and I don't know if I'm the best person for them. Because as soon as somebody will pop out, I'll be like, oh my God, you're so cute. Look at that makeup. <laughs> oh you're so committed gosh. to the role, little werewolf. Come on, little chainsaw man. Do your thing, chainsaw uh, man. Yeah, and they would just that's break amazing. down and give me dap and just be like, all right, cool. Rawr. Let's look, keep it pushing. Look. As a 12-year-old, I dressed up as dead asleep. I had, like, a knife going through my head and, like, blood everywhere. And I walked through a haunted house, and they were afraid to scare me. They, like, wouldn't oh, come up to me. Oh, oh, so I was just, like, oh, looking oh, at them being like, I see you. And they were like, um, stay away from me, creepy little girl. Gee, why are you, why are you in here like this? This is We can pay for this. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, so since you love it so much, I imagine you probably got a few. But, but what's at the top of your list? What's a Halloween classic that maybe you watch watching every year? Some of my favorites that I would definitely not watch every year because they are absolutely absurd. Uh, White Zombie is one of the first zombie movies. Um, so okay. if you were doing like a zombie marathon, you would start with White Zombie because it's one of the first. And they go down to like the Haitian roots of zombieism. And it is also absurd. It's got Bella Lugosi in it, which is a win. <laughs> but they also like, I swear, I swear to you, they like shaved an eagle and decided it was a vulture. And they have it like <laughs> do this, this absurd cawing. <laughs> several times to like harbinger <laughs> as like a harbinger of terrible things looking out the happen. window got a lot more exciting when you said that I was like hmm let me just look out I'm the window saying. while you talk about this I'm scary bird saying. Ari you had a, a, an opposite reaction when I asked about horror movies uh, do you do you like scary movies here's the thing like no okay let's not use the word like but do I will I watch them in community because I have a fear of missing out so I want to be like people can't be like going out and watching stuff without me. Like that's not going to happen. I don't I like it. to be left out. Um, and it's because of Child's Play, a Chicago classic. Yes. OK. Um, mm -hmm. That <laughs> has changed my life. But like to this day, if I go over somebody's house and like I use their bathroom and the, the shower curtain is closed, I need to open it to make sure that there's not like a knife wielding you just looking for Chucky when you go into people's house <laughs> because That's what if what he's you do <laughs> what if he's what if he's behind the shower curtain I like that you mentioned child's play though 1988 brought Chucky to the mainstream uh, vernacular. And it, it's on our friends over at Axios. Justin Kaufman put out a list yesterday of Chicago area horror films to watch this Halloween. And obviously, Child's Play is on there. So other, a few other ones with some with some Chicago-ish connections. Uh, you know, the 1978 classic Halloween is on there. Obviously, Candyman is is on the list. So if you, want, if you are interested in horror movies, Crystal will drop this link for you so that you can go through and and uh, think a little nostalgia and reflect on all of these movies. I'm yes, sure please, you've you. seen to this point. 
Every single Friday, we bring in some friends across the city to break down some key stories that were important to us this week. Uh, Ari, we are going to start with you. Some news came out of Cook County Jail uh, that says the population inside the jail is at a is pushing a 40 year low. Uh, yes. But but there's some further analysis here about why. Uh, can you catch us up on this story? Yes. So as we know, Chicago and Illinois have we've recently made history as becoming the first state um, to eliminate cash bail. And that is a big deal because we know that a lot of people who are in jail, just to make that clear, people who are in jail awaiting trial, not people who have been convicted of anything, but who are awaiting trial, a lot of the reasons why they are there is because they can't afford to post bail. Um, And so eliminating cash bail, um, advocates of that um, really argue that it's an equity issue. And so um, because of this, people are saying that this historic low is likely because of that. If someone is deemed dangerous um, or too risky to be released, a judge can still keep them in jail. So it doesn't mean that, you know, anyone is released, but it just means that, for example, if you shoplift, it's likely that, you know, you would be released and that you wouldn't be held in jail for that. And so um, it's a pretty big deal um, because of overcrowding in jails have generally been a pretty big deal, um, especially here in Cook County. Yeah. The the numbers say that from the first week of August, the facility's population has dropped 10.4 percent. Um, we already saw some uh, information that said the, the population was going down as Chicago and Cook County was they were already preparing themselves for the end of cash bail, which they saw as very likely and uh, officially went into impact earlier uh, this summer. Uh, and so they said that population has already started to drop. But You know, the co-director of Loyola Center for Criminal Justice says, while we take this good news, we still want to watch and pay attention because with judges discretion in play, as you said earlier, they still have the final say on whether or not somebody is kept in jail. We want to see are are we seeing that people are kept in longer because just Mm -hmm. because we have fewer people being held, we still need to pay attention. What does that mean for the people who are held in Cook County? Are they facing longer wait times? And, and so now there, there is more to be seen. Crystal, I want to bring you in here. For the last uh, year and a half, we've been talking about now 18,500 migrants living in Chicago, many of which are staying in temporary housing facilities. Many are staying in police stations uh, over at O'Hare Airport. And this week we heard from a group of organizations out of St. Louis that want to help Chicago uh, and other major cities. Uh, Can you explain what's going on here? Yeah, so the International Institute of St. Louis uh, is interested in actually bringing some of the asylum seekers to St. Louis. Um, They've had a population decline um, and they're looking to fill that gap essentially. So where we have an abundance of people, they're thinking, hey, what if we brought some of the asylum seekers to St. Louis? Um, and they can provide them with housing for about three months or so, cell phones, job training, apprenticeship programs. And, you know, a lot of the asylum seekers that have come here, they're, they're, they're skilled workers. <laughs> they weren't just sitting around back home. Uh, so, you know, that actually could provide some necessary skilled labor uh, to St. Louis. It's it's interesting. Obviously, this is organizations in St. Louis, and we know the organizations in uh, Chicago have been, you know, rallying in the same way to provide resources. I want to know, do you find it interesting that this, you know, especially when we think about population decline, so much has been talked about Chicago goes population decline over the last couple of decades that we we know that that is happening in Chicago. But it, it, it seems coming out of St. Louis where we're hearing like, like this can be seen as a, a good thing, whereas in Chicago is only being talked about as a burden. Yeah, so I think what you do have is a, a sort of, what the difference that you have here is that there was a sudden explosion of people in Chicago and nowhere to put them immediately. And so you have a very visible 
population of people now sleeping outside as more arrive and there's less room at police stations. And you do have people stepping up. Most of the efforts um, that are being made to house these people, even if it's intense, uh, some people giving up their own houses, are being done by on-the-ground volunteers and activists um, and advocate groups, such as the 19th Ward Mutual Aid Group, um, which I just recently wrote about, uh, which is helping to put up a sort of tent city and a garden across the street from the 22nd Precinct Station, for example. You know, people are actually in support of this. But yes, like you say, a lot are against it. So I think the difference is that St. Louis isn't currently dealing with 18,000 asylum Mm. seekers. And they can come here and sort of say, okay, well, we have some resources available. How about we take some versus buses suddenly arriving in the middle of the night with no sense of organization? Yeah, they did say we could take, I think at one point in one of the reports, they said they could take somewhere like they had beds ready for eight people. And it was like, (laughs) we we need beds for as many people as possible. Uh, But I appreciate you providing that context. I mean, This week, the conversation continues. There's a uh, community meeting expected in Brighton Park next week because there's a proposed location uh, over in the 12th Ward to put up one of these sort of, as it's been called, a a migrant base camp. And that's being met with a lot of pushback. I mean, yesterday we saw dozens of community members protesting Alderwoman Julia Ramirez, who was there, who was saying, you know, regardless of how I vote on this, it is likelihood if, you know, Chicago's water department approves it, that this will come to the neighborhood. But let's not buy into, you know, fear mongering. Let's not buy into conservative narratives about what this means. And even with that, they essentially ran her out of uh, of the protest. You, you saw her being shuffled back to a car and taken out. You know, when, when you were visiting the Edna White Community Garden, you know, how how do you see these two realities being balanced between, you know, the city is running out of resources, neighborhood members are, are are protesting, camps being put up, but then you also have real human beings out here trying to figure out what is the next step after a tumultuous journey to begin with? Yeah, so what I found from um, some of the volunteers that are working at the Edna White Center is that they're really burnt out. Uh, they're not getting a lot of support from the city. There's some communication and coordination, but ultimately even the city isn't getting a lot of notification as to when these buses are going to arrive. It's a lot of guesswork. So for example, at Edna White, they have a sort of alert system (laughs) where whoever sees a bus arrive has to call a certain volunteer and that volunteer can then arrange to have them moved into the the sort of tent city set up at the garden. Uh, If the police station is too full or if there are no kids with them, um, they have systems where they're literally packaging supplies um, that every so that everyone gets the same supply so there's no sort of free-for-all. Uh, but these are systems that they're setting up entirely on their own, and they're burning out. You know, the needs are endless. There's constantly people arriving. So they want to help, but it's hard work when they also have their own jobs and things to do as well, right? Um, and then there's the issue of the, the land itself. So at the garden, you know, they're not worried about the garden. It's land. It will recover, as Kathy Feigl said. Uh, who runs the garden there. But it does take a toll to have this many people on a place that's not set up for people. No no sewage, no no bathrooms, you know, things like that. People need to shower. Um, so I think when people are pushing back against the encampments that, that are proposed for the city, you know, half of it is nimbyism. <laughs> you know, I just don't want that here. Some of it is probably certainly uh, just anger at the the situation uh but i think some, some of it is anger genuine. at the contractor some, who is being yes. hired to build this <laughs> on a 30 million dollar price tag absolutely absolutely some of it's also anger at where the money's going versus you know where they think the money should go um you know i think the issues that um kathy feigl and tim noonan who runs the 19th ward mutual aid group have brought up is that people are constantly trying to create sides and say, well, you know, we're putting all this effort and money into people who are new here. What about the uh, people who have been here for a while and and have been homeless, et cetera? But as they point out, though they might appear similar, they're actually wildly different needs for people who need citizenship and have just arrived here and have children that, you know, and and have no connections. Um, It's it's a wildly complicated issue, and I'm definitely rambling about it now, but you can talk about it to no end.
moving forward, right now we are seeing budget hearings taking place in the city council. Uh, one department in the city of Chicago, there, there are co- some concerns, particularly the Chicago Department of Public Health. That COVID relief money that so many agencies, departments, states and cities have relied on to prop up their revenue is drying up over the next few years. And the Department of Public Health uh, will not be spared of this. Ari, how big of a hit could the department's budget see? So about a hundred million dollars. And that's a lot of money. And that's even with the fact that Mayor uh, Brandon Johnson has like recommended that the budget allocate more money to the Department of Public Health. And this is really an issue for a lot of reasons, because not only was this, you know, COVID relief money used for what we think it is, right? Like, of course, probably vaccinations and, you know, testing, right? Of course that. But also, it was used for staffing. It's also been used 500 for... 500 s- more staff members. Yes, yes, 500 more staff members. Um, It's also been used for stuff that is, like, adjacent, like, public, um, like, mental health services, for example, right? Uh, we know that in recent years... um. Former Mayor Lori Lightfoot, her strategy was really kind of to allocate a lot of money to a lot of nonprofit organizations that were providing a lot of that service. Right. So without this extra money, you know, we have this really huge gap in where the funding can come from. And our friends over in Black Club Chicago make a really important point that the public health department has also traditionally been funded by a lot of grant money. And this is just really not the best sustainable model um, going forward. Yeah, about 87 percent of the department's $888 million budget for 2024 comes from grants. And they said even before the pandemic, this was the case. And they said what we see is a crisis model that the public health department only gets more staff members, only gets more money, and only gets more attention when we're facing a public health crisis, a la COVID. But after that falls back, the attention sort of gets moved away and we go back to understaffing and underfunding, which then makes us inadequate to respond to the next crisis moment. Right now, as we view just what the numbers are telling us, we just see this gap, which... Mm -hmm would mean that the next time we have a pandemic or any other type of crisis will be in a similar situation where, you know, we'll be in a worse case again, right? We already know playing catch that up. Play, we're playing catch up, right? We know that when COVID first came, we saw that, you know, black and brown neighborhoods who did not have the best public health infrastructure were worse hit, um, had the most deaths. And so what would happen if we're just kind of comp- repeating that cycle? Yeah. Crystal, you wrote an amazing story earlier this week about uh, public infrastructure in this city, but around public basketball courts. Uh, can you take us to the Beverly neighborhood? And I mean, first I want to ask, why, why were you interested in this story? Oh, boy. Yeah. So I moved to the Beverly neighborhood last year, and I remember uh, driving past the community center nearby Ridge Park and seeing a young person uh, shooting a basketball. And I was thinking, oh, great, there's a basketball court over there. Uh, so I walk over a few weeks later, and I'm like, well, that's that's a tennis court. That is not a basketball court. Uh, and then I start noticing, I start looking around and I'm like, there are, there, I haven't seen any basketball courts. This is kind of weird. Um, and then, you know, put that together with the, another puzzle piece where I'm driving down the street and I see a bunch of kids suddenly run out of the middle of the street. And I'm like, what trouble are y'all up to? <laughs> They're playing basketball in the middle of the street. They have a rollaway hoop that they put on the corner and they play in the middle of the street because that's where they have the space to do so. And and that's when it kind of all connected. And I started looking into the numbers and doing a little bit of research and was like, oh, my gosh, I don't think there's a single basketball court in this neighborhood. And it turns out there isn't. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. Uh, 23 years ago, there was an article in the Chicago Tribune. They did an investigation looking into basketball courts and why they were disappearing. And they highlighted the 19th Ward, which is Beverly, Morgan Park, and Mount Greenwood. And they found that several courts had been removed from the parks 
actively removed. Uh, and I know around the city, a lot, uh, this is a big issue around the city, you know, rims and nets taken down. That's one thing. In Beverly, and they, they were actively removed the whole court. Like, you got to dig up, like, asphalt, you know, <laughs> to take out the whole court. There's one court in the 19th Ward. It's in Morgan Park. It's at Black Welder Park. Um, and that is, that is it. That is the only basketball court here. You know, um, I spoke with, um, the Brother Rice coach, uh, Brother Rice is the high school here of note for basketball. And he said, you know, he grew up playing street ball and he actually noticed that the kids that are coming through his program don't have as much leadership skills because they're not out there on the weekends playing around and organizing themselves. They have a little bit less of a competitive streak because, they're not having to really push and like fight against other teams playing and players, at the park. right? At the playing at the park, but also because like you play at the park and you lose, what happens? You get benched, right? You got to sit yep. there and you got to wait for the next team, wait. the next team, the next team. Uh, but just on top of that, I spoke to some local kids, and they they just they were bewildered to hear that there had been courts here at some point. They were like, "What? Why did they take them out?" Yeah. And and you see, in many neighborhoods, basketball courts completely removed or basketball courts left to degrade, left to be, you know, left in a state in which nobody would want to play. The Chicago Reader did a story a couple of years ago. And at the time, they said in the last decade, 16 basketball courts and 42 backboards have been removed from Chicago parks. But when you look and dive deeper into the neighborhoods and where they're removed from, places like Rogers Park, Albany Park, near West Side, East Garfield Park, Bronzeville, they found that, or West Town, they, the correlation was where the value in homes was going up, the uh, where the neighborhoods were gentrifying, the basketball courts were disappearing, which is to say people don't want to see black and brown kids congregating in their neighborhoods. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons it took place in Beverly. As the black population was growing in Beverly, the association of basketball courts, which is unfounded in sociologist research with the rise in sort of violence in a neighborhood or at a park, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you saw those things being linked together and basketball courts being removed at the same time. Tennis courts were being removed uh, from from black and brown neighborhoods. And so just the idea that, you know, the spaces where kids gather, uh, not being supported by a community, not being a part of the vision of a neighborhood. It's one of those very subtle things that when people say, well, is segregation involved in everything that goes on in Chicago? Yes, Yes, it's not just these sort of <laughs> yes. big things you think yeah, in terms of where are homes built, where do resources flood, but also, you know, something as simple as like how are the parks designed, where are the basketball courts and where they're not. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's why I'm always I'm always stand on that claim that any Chicago story is also a story of, of Chicago segregation. Uh, I mean, Ari, have you seen in your lifetime, you're a far South side resident, yeah, uh, yeah. the, you know, the degradation or the disappearance of basketball courts. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I am in pretty black neighborhoods still where there has not been any, you know, gentrification. Um, but even still, there is often like a very, very high police presence. So you don't see kids gathering like we used to. So the parks that I used to hang out at, you know, go and say, oh, the boys are out playing basketball. We're going to walk around and be at the park. Like I always was <laughs> at the park. OK, I was always at the park. Um, and now I drive past those same parks and they are empty. And I think it's just really a shame because I think that we talk a lot about wanting our kids to be um, self-sufficient. We want them to be smart adults. Well, that comes with giving them the freedom as young people to be able to maneuver through the city and, you know, in their neighborhoods. And if we take that away from them, then we're really doing them a disadvantage. We're not allowing them to grow. That reminds me. That's something that I didn't get to report on in the story is that many of the parents I spoke to talked about how with the advent of technology and social media, mm -hmm. you're just more aware of a lot of the horrible things that do happen. Yeah. And so it's harder for them to sort of just let their kids go out and do whatever. That said, 
you also hear on the other side people saying, you know, well, if the kids don't have basketball courts to go to or other places to go to, yeah. then you either have the parents literally driving them to programs that are very structured, which is, again, where you're losing the leadership and the independence, um, or you have kids that are bored out of their minds and doing I'm going to go ahead and say it. Stupid things like standing on busy streets and throwing rocks at cars. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, or, or just getting into trouble because they're bored. Um, and, you know, they don't want to always be a part of something that's structured and has a program or costs money uh, to yes. participate in. You know, so there's just, you know, a lot less freedom in the streets. <laughs> Every single episode of City Cash Chicago ends the same way with some good news. Hey. To okay. get the listener through the episode, the rest of the day, or the weekend. Uh, Crystal, I want to start with you. What is your some good news? Come on. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, <laughs> I do have some good news. Um, after that story published, some of the kids I talked to, Elias Gray uh, and Donato Calito, they actually are working on a school project to <gasps> bring basketball courts to Beverly. Oh, um, that's, that's, that's oh. some good news. I think I'm not sure Donato is. I know Elias is, and uh, and rumor has it some other kids are working on that. Um, so I think that's some great news. And I and I spoke to Jamal Cole as well. Ran into him at the coffee shop, and, uh, and he uh, said that you know there's some movement going now behind the uh, Save Street Ball campaign that he started. Yay. Yeah, Cole, for people who might not remember, is a former congressional candidate as well as the the founder of My Block, My Hood, My City. Ari, let the people know, what is your some good news? Well, well past the Cochran. Um, or Deacon. <laughs> Deacon. You had that, that Deacon, um, you know, in your, in your throat. Um, <laughs> I would say I'm very excited that, you know, we've all had, this is, been a rough couple weeks, right? You know, the news is very heavy locally and internationally. And I know a lot of us are taking that in as we should, right? We should be taking it in and not turning a blind eye to all that's going on. Um, But I'm very happy that it is homecoming season, right? On all the levels, right? So I've been seeing like a lot of my friends, like all of their like high schoolers getting dressed up and going to homecoming and they Mm -hmm. look so so cute. Um, and then on the old folks side of things, okay, it is a it is time for the alums to go back to their colleges and <laughs> act a fool, okay? Fam you, Florida AM University on the highest of seven hills. I will be there next weekend, okay? So the freshman class of 2003, this is our 20th year anniversary. So we're hey. we're trying to go back. I have been begging all my friends. So, you know, we're going <laughs> a quick little weekend trip. We in and we're out, but we are there. And I'm just so excited. I'm just so excited. So it's just good to get to see people, love on people, hug them, let them know that you care about them. It's a blessing to be able to see people and for them to be in your life because we know that tomorrow is not promised. There's so much going on in the world. And so getting to like just have good times with your people, I think I'm appreciating it more and more. And yeah. wear something sparkly. <laughs> Gotta wear something sparkly. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And to piggyback on that, if you can't make it back to your college, there will be a HBCU alumni uh, homecoming tap takeover at Daisy's Po' Boy and Tavern tomorrow Ooh. at 11 a.m. Uh, okay. alongside Funky Town Brewery, which is going to be debuting their seasonal homecoming beer. Uh, and so, yeah, I love Daisy's. I love me a good Po' Boy. Me and too. The, the Po' Boys are a little, they're a little expensive. They're a little expensive. But they were. They were. <laughs> but they, they is fire. It. They is fire. I got two rounds of good news for folks today. One is I got to brag on the homie Ari. Her book, We Are the Culture, Black Chicago's Influence on Everything, is now available for pre-order. I got my pre-order in earlier this week. And as they're reading it, you know, they might, there might be some familiar people in there with some quotes. Yeah, somebody, you know, a, a host. A host, a host of, of a some very sort. of a very popular of a of deacon best, of some kind of the best <laughs> daily podcast in the city of Chicago. You know, hey, come on, I appreciate you. Have you have to and hold the notes longer if you want deacon title though. Oh my, some good news. Oh no, I ain't got it today. I ain't got it. I tried. I ain't got it at the end. I ain't got it. <laughs> 
I ain't got it. Uh, and then, <laughs> just some random good news, but this is one of my, it was one of my favorite weeks um, of all, of the entire year because pretty much all the sports are happening right around right now. <laughs> Some are ending. The WNBA finals ended this week. But at one point, that was happening. The NBA preseason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The football was popping. Baseball playoffs been crazy. And I know y'all think, it's, well, <laughs> it ain't no Chicago teams in the baseball playoffs. It be like that sometimes. It ain't no Chicago team in the WNBA finals. It be like that sometimes. <laughs> but in my lifetime, we didn't want to chip in all of them sports. And so you know what? I ain't as sad when we ain't in the MLB and the WNBA playoffs. Mm-hmm. I've seen us get championships in that. And so this week, next week, they're just two of my favorite sports weeks of the entire year because pretty much everything that I love to watch is going on at the same time. And then that leads right into the Bulls coming out next week. I, I mean, I, I love the Bulls. <laughs> Win, lose, anyway. a draw. But this is the, this is the issue because this is your good news. That, but this is my bad news because <laughs> it's already hard <laughs> enough for a single girl out here to get a date. Oh, no. <laughs> On Sunday, oh, during during football season, okay, you already get the I'm watching football text. And you did not bring this into the good news segment. Yes, you did not. yes. And now I'm gonna have football did. and basketball to compete with. So it's gonna be something every day, every day, every day. Wow. Yeah, basketball got a ruthless. Hang on. Basketball a got a ruthless, ruthless schedule. schedule. So ruthless. I'm not gonna get no dates until after this, after like March Madness now. Look, so, you know, all you got to do is is join the bracket. Just get into yeah. the basketball. I'm going to be like, yeah, let's play that ball. What type of ball? I don't know. Don't this this was a great field goal for the jump ball. I hope you know oh. right now that you are breaking hearts across the city <laughs> and not in a good way. <laughs> I ain't got no time for y'all. I hey. can't. This don't ask me to to learn the sports because I've gone to sports this, classes. This sports. Yes, I've got. I took a football <laughs> class to try to learn about football, and I still don't know anything. Just go play. Look, we uh, we gonna get you. We're gonna get you. Yes, give right? me right. Give me right, Crystal. <laughs> give me right. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I want to give a huge shout out to our guest today, professor, author, and sports lover, Ariane Nettles, <laughs> freelance journalist, Crystal <laughs> Paul. Thank y'all for making time for City Cash Chicago. Uh, we got to do this again, y'all. This yes. is hilarious. Thank you, Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Bye. Before I let you go, I want to give a huge thank you to the people who make City Cash Chicago and our newsletter, Hey Chicago. That's lead producer, Simone Alisea, our new producer, Michelle Navarro, the one and only newsletter editor, Sydney Madden. Our roving producers this week were Natalie Rivera, Noah Snyderman, and Lizzie Goldsmith. The music we all love is from the homie Sam Thousand, all the kimonos, and Mark Greenberg from the Mayfair Workshop. Remember to do me a huge favor today. Nominate City Cash Chicago as best podcast and Hey Chicago as best newsletter for the Chicago Reader's Best of 2023 list. The podcast trying to get that old 3 P. Check the link in the show notes and enter us in under the City Life category. As always, we appreciate you for reading and listening. We back in your inbox and feeds on Monday. We'll talk to you then. Peace. Please, please, please come back on Monday. We need the increased listenership. And please download. Please download. Podcast metrics are hard. And download has become the industry standard for success. Please download. Download. (laughs) And open your newsletter and click on the hyperlinks, please. Bye.